Hey, we're back with Be Cuban. I'm Brian Sanders. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing with a friend. And make sure to start back at episode one. All the great episodes. Got to go back. Listen to them all. Thanks to Nosetail, my company, for sponsoring this show. We couldn't do it without our great ranchers here in Texas. We get all the good meats straight to you, straight to your door. We have the best stuff, regeneratively raised. Our pork is pasture-raised on a corn-free, soy-free diet. The best of the best. All of our stuff is fantastic. I eat it all the time. It's great. We're getting it down to Austin, down at the Sapien Center, and we are getting it out to people locally. If you don't live in Austin, you can get it through the mail. We get it right to you. Go to nosetail.org, make yourself a box today, and look at all the other stuff we got there. We got the body care products made from beef tallow. You want that animal fat for your animal body. You want that on your skin. You don't want any plant chemicals and random oils and and all other stuff they put in skincare products. You don't want that. You want our stuff. Just what your body needs. Soaks it up. It's amazing, I'm telling you. Not just because it's my company, because it is amazing. And our biltong, meat on the go, air dried, no curing agents, no sugar, and the seasonings, no fillers, none of that stuff. And that's all at nosetail.org. Go to nosetail.org, make yourself a box. And now our new sponsor, Element, LMNT. They are awesome. They've been friends of mine forever. Bunch of great guys working there. Rob Wolf, Luis, Tyler, such cool people. Been using their product for years. It's these little packets of electrolytes. Easy to use on the go. I play beach volleyball in the Texas heat and always take two packs of Element in 64 ounces of water. It's so good. I get hydrated. I get my electrolytes. It's potassium, magnesium, bunch of good salt. A lot of people need to make sure they're getting enough electrolytes. A lot of people don't get enough. And these ones are great because they have no fillers, no colorings, no agents, none of that stuff. It's just like what we do at Nose and Tail. We don't put in the funny stuff. The Element guys, they don't put any funny stuff in it. Go to drinkelement.com slash peakhuman. That's drinklmnt.com slash peakhuman to get your free sampler pack. They're giving away one of every single flavor if you make an order through my link. Support them. They're supporting me. We're supporting each other. They're doing good things. It's one of the few products that I actually believe in and use myself and that I wanted to bring on the show to let people know that they exist, that they're great. They should try it out. Maybe some people are having problems with electrolyte issues and they don't know it. They don't know why. They're not feeling quite right. Muscle cramping, all these small things that people may not notice, they're from lack of electrolytes. So I like to get as much as I can from my diet, but when I'm out there sweating for three hours playing beach volleyball, you need more. So I use Element. So that's it for the sponsors. We got Element, we got Nose to Tail, and also we got Sapien, sapien.org. Just go there, put your email in, you'll get all the news in the newsletter, hear about the content I release each week. We get some good articles to you from around the web. We have some specials. Sometimes we have special offers at Nose the Tail. Sometimes we have other deals. Just join the newsletter so you won't miss anything. We'll give you updates on events. We have big events coming up at the Sapien Center next year. That's here in Austin. And now on to my guest, Metabolic Mike. Mike Mutzel, my man. Love Mike. He's been on YouTube and doing podcasts and doing content for years. Always have loved his content. Got to stop by his house a few years ago, do a podcast with him in person. He told me he was down in Austin, so we had a whole event around him at the Sapien Center. It was great. It was last week. We filled up the center with a bunch of awesome people, did a presentation, and we're going to share that with you today. And again, like I did with Dr. Asim, we sat down before we started recording, and we did a little intro for you in front of a live audience. So you hear the intro with Mike and then the presentation. So you got to find that on YouTube. It might be hard to follow if you're listening to this, but he did a blood work masterclass. He did a deep dive into all these markers that people should know. Mainstream doctors don't know this stuff. Even a lot of these functional medicine doctors don't know all this stuff. And he's been working with a lot of clients for many years. So he has a lot of inside knowledge on these advanced details of your blood work. So check this one out on YouTube. This one doesn't have to go to Rumble, although I still will put it on Rumble. But this one will not get censored from YouTube. We do not talk about anything controversial. We just give you good info from Metabolic Mike. So since 2006, Mike Mutzel has blended his formal education, a degree in biology, 
and graduate work in clinical nutrition with his competitive athletic background and personal training experience to help others improve their health. He completed his graduate studies in applying functional medicine in clinical practice, AFMCP program through the Institute for Functional Medicine, IFM, and he continually works with healthcare professionals as a functional medicine consultant. He regularly conducts live webinars and workshops to, to help healthcare professionals keep abreast of the rapid advancements in the fields of nutrition, metabolism, and immunity. He's great. He's great. He knows what's going on in the world. He sees through all the mainstream bogus stuff. And I think you're going to enjoy this presentation. Watch it on YouTube. Look at all the slides. We had it filmed. We put all the slides in. It was a lot of work. So make sure to check it out. Check out nosetail.org and also get your element. Get your free sampler pack. Drinkelement.com slash peak human. Good stuff, everyone. <laughs> also go to saving.org, get on the newsletter, and we will see you next week. Hey everyone, welcome back to Peak Human. We're doing another live intro. We're here with Metabolic Mike. How's it going? Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Brian. Yeah, Mike's in Austin, so we're doing a little live event. Can you tell us what the event's going to be about? Yes, yeah, so we're going to take a deeper dive into blood work analysis, looking more at patterns, trends, to sort of ascertain if people have insulin resistance, metabolic dysregulation, and where to start with lifestyle exercise and uh, nutritional prescriptions. So that's kind of the, the idea is to look more at the health of the liver using liver function tests. And all these things are readily available through you know standard physicians or LabCorp now or directlabs.com. We're also gonna talk about blood viscosity. I think it's really timely considering now the flu is back and, and post COVID and things like that, people, their blood viscosity has been shown to increase and that is an under-recognized driver of cardiovascular disease that's even more sensitive and causative than say LDL cholesterol that everyone is so focused on. And then we're gonna talk about apolipoprotein B, which is on the exterior portion of LDL cholesterol and VLDL and so forth. And for whatever reason, when most people go to their doctor's office with an annual physical, ApoB is missing. And that really leads us to not make good clinical conclusions about what's going on cardiometabolically with those individuals. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about exercise and DHEA. And also, again, liver health is a big focus mm. as well. So you just told me we might not have a lot of time to get in the exercise part, so we'll do a little bit up front right now. Yeah. And just to let people know, if people heard that train crossing, we're live, we're here at the Sapien Center. We got some people eating some charcuterie boards behind us, and yeah, we're doing a lot of events here. This is gonna be a really great one. We've got about 55, 60 people coming. Amazing. So I wanna let people know too, if you're in town, come by and visit, or if you're like Mike and you, you know, you're an influencer or a content creator, let me know and come by and let's do an event. It's an awesome center. There's a gym in the back, the sauna, plunges, that's great. <laughs> we got it all. We got uh, our members doing workouts right behind us right now. That's cool. But uh, yeah, so tell us more about the exercise stuff that you're not gonna get into. Yeah, in talk. well, I think exercise as an intervention to improve metabolic health is again, underappreciated. Just simply walking, especially in the post-meal window, is so effective for decreasing glucose and also lipids in the post-meal window. And if we think about you know, heart disease is still the number one cause of mortality here in the U.S. and all throughout the world. And so if we're serious about saving lives, then we need to prevent heart disease. And, and a simple way to do that is to become more metabolically flexible. And a lot of people have hitherto up to now improved their metabolic health with low carb diets. And that's been awesome. And there's also been fasting. But thankfully, there's new research on resistance training specifically, not just cardio or walking, showing that it actually can support longevity, decrease cardiovascular disease. And so I, I think that we're at this sort of precipice of, of new awareness about that exercise should be a foundation. And I've just read so many comments over the years of posting low carb content where people said, hey, I, I lost weight eating bacon and ribeyes. Why do I need to exercise? And it's like, well, that's great that you lost the weight, like good for you. Mm -hmm. But you, there's other things that you can and should be doing to support your muscle because uh, unfortunately, we start to lose muscle as we age. And if we want to preserve our insulin sensitivity, we need muscle. And if we want good blood sugar regulation, 80% of you know, your post meal glucose is going into muscle. So if you don't have muscle, it's a problem. And so I think yeah, I just want to encourage more and more people to start resistance training. And tonight we will talk about using um, serum creatinine as a proxy to look at overall muscle health. And I found over the years working with clients is low creatinine to be quite common in people who just don't exercise mm -hmm. or, or who are under muscled. And so there's just simple ways to sort of look at this now. And people 
really experience transformations when they start to get stronger, they feel better, um, you know, they're just doing more things volitionally, you know, their recreational activity, gardening, going on hikes, doing trips that they never thought they could because they're more physically fit, which I think is just amazing. I think I've, I've seen the same thing where there's, there's this older middle-aged crowd that just is like, hey, I lost weight, I'm fine. But I went to Africa two years ago for the Food Lies film and I, you know, was spending time with hunter gatherers and it, a little change went off in my head. It's like, in the US, it's like, it's good to exercise, right? It's like the notion of, it would be good if I exercised. I realized the human baseline is to exercise. It's required, like some sort of movement. Right. Like they're not going and hitting a gym. They're going on six hour hikes and we did like an eight hour hunt with the Hadza. It's like, this is just normal business. Like the human body requires movement. That's so essential. Uh, and so if you think about the organ of muscle, if you think about, say, your pancreas, it depends upon stimulation from the brain and gut hormones to release insulin. The muscle depends upon movement to release these chemicals called myokines or exerkines, which go to your liver, to your fat cells, to your brain, improve cognition, memory, prevent dementia. And so if we're not moving our muscle, we're really um, causing dysfunctional signaling throughout the body. And like you said, life has become so complacent and easy. You, you don't, there's no need to leave your house anymore. You can or have Alexa or Siri do everything for you. And so that's why we need to bake in structured activities. And that's why we do need to do things like, you know, now if you live in a country, you're chopping wood. Um, I was watching this video on uh, people in Siberia, how they procure their water. They have to get all of the water during the month of September from the river and freeze it. And then every day chip away at it mm. just to get enough water to drink. And most people would not even have the bandwidth to do that. To take a shower, they're chopping wood for 45 minutes just to take a shower. And they only take a shower one day a week because it's so much effort to do so. So um, if you're not doing those things in your life, you work on a computer, you work from home. It's great if you walk your dog, but then you should be doing push-ups, pull-ups, you know, Turkish get-ups, kettlebell swings, you know, glute bridges, things like that. Um, again, to pre preserve this muscle, but also to cause that signaling that is so helpful. Like I said, BDNF in the brain and, and the myokine release and all of that. It's great stuff. We're going to get more into it in the talk. One more thing before we start, we talked about carb cycling before and I was saying myself, I actually went low carb for many years and then I brought them back in. I just switched them instead of eating like refined grains and like bread, I just started eating like fruit and whole food carbs. So maybe you could talk a little more about that and even timing them, like when to eat them around the workout, stuff like that. Yeah, it's such a good point. I think, you know, it comes back to this binary thinking. Um, carbs are bad because they raise your glucose, so therefore I shouldn't have them. But actually, uh, when you're doing resistance training, like we were just talking about the importance of, you actually want to be burning glucose during that workout. And that actually helps your muscles in, improve strength and hypertrophy and recovery. So timing carbs around exercise um, doesn't negatively, you know, you know, predispose you to developing diabetes or all the metabolic complications because you're actually using those carbohydrates during the exercise session. So I think for a lot of years, many people became dogmatic because we were excited about ketones and all the metabolic properties that ketones offer. And that's really exciting and phenomenal. However, if we take a step back and look at this from a bigger picture and think about the whole body, particularly the muscle, it makes more sense to optimize the exercise session. And part of one way to do that is to have either intra-workout carbs. Some people, if you're heavily muscled or training intensely, pre-workout carbs. And for people who are just sort of newbies but have a good workout, maybe post-workout carbs. And what people will find is it doesn't disproportionately increase your blood glucose or cause a lot of deleterious changes, metabolically speaking. So mm -hmm. reframing, you know, again, I think the pendulum is always swinging. It swung a little bit too far in, in the opposite direction, that all carbs are bad and they must be mm -hmm. avoided and all that too. Well, what if we think about in context? Because if you look at various fitness models, you know, and um, natural athletes that are competing, some of these people have 300, 400 grams of carbs per day, and they're not metabolically sick, nor are they overweight or obese. So it has to do with the training intensity and the volume. So I think personalizing the carbs, instead of setting an arbitrary number, you only can have 20, carbs, 20 grams a day to be in ketosis or whatever. Say, well, on days that I'm training, I can have, say, 50, 60, 100. Days that I'm traveling, maybe it is 20. And, and think about when you're gonna consume those carbs, ideally around exercise. I love that. I love being more thoughtful about it. And uh, yeah, I'm glad more people are kind of waking up that there's a difference. Like there's a huge difference between a donut and a piece of fruit. Like it's just totally, it's wildly different. So 
Great stuff. Uh, if you're listening to this, we're going to watch it on YouTube. We're doing a live presentation and good stuff, Mike. Let's Thank do it. Thank you. I'm ready. Well, thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Brian, for the event. And we're going to have a lot of fun talking about labs and blood work. Um, I, we could just free flow like this. I mean, I'm comfortable with that, but I do have a lot of labs, like screenshots and ranges and things like that. So would a presentation style work or just want to shoot from the hip and, and go through common trends and patterns? Totally up to you all. Presentation. OK, we're, we're working on it. Yeah, do you have, um, you hooked up the Wi-Fi? Uh, yes. Okay. All right, so we'll do presentation and not to waste your time, we're gonna get right into, um, how about we go to Gmail? Yeah. Oh, it's not, okay. it's still syncing. Bad, sorry. No, so seeking. See, um, yep. Yeah. Here, I'll let you do it. Yeah, thank you, sorry. So, who's had labs in the last year or two years? Most people. Pretty awesome. Now, did you run them yourself or did you go to the doctor and get them run for you? Like, did. It's kind of a mix of, of both. Now, you, I heard r ran myself because why? We get frustrated when you go to the doctor and you're like, hey, I think I have this going on or I've heard about this and they say, oh, that's not important. You're like, well, actually, my health is important to me. Now, I see why some physicians do that and some health professionals do that because they don't want you to be the doctor. That's why you're seeing them. And I implore all of you, you're hiring the doctor to help improve your health. So if you're dissatisfied, guess what you do? You find a new one. So many people, and this is a very basic, they feel obliged or obligated or think, oh my gosh, well, my insurance is through Kaiser, so I have to go to Kaiser. It's like, you don't have to. You can pay cash. You vote with your dollars. So please find a doctor who will work with you. I, and that, I just wanted to preface this in a little disclaimer. You know, I'm not a doctor, okay? I'm, uh, you know, but I have been taught and trained and I've been doing this work for 17 years and I've reviewed many physicians, their own labs, because they didn't know how to interpret them the way that we're going to talk about it. And it's not magic. This isn't some rocket science. It's actually very basic. We're going to look at patterns and clusters instead of focusing on one off biomarkers. Okay. And so that's kind of the goal here. And we're going to focus on something that is often ignored and that is blood viscosity. Who's kind of heard about blood viscosity? Quite a few of you, amazing. So if you think about motor oil, why is it so thick, it's so thick and viscous? It has a lot of shear stress. Okay, so when you get dehydrated, if you get an infection, for a lot of men, you know, they have increased blood viscosity because of testosterone. Testosterone increases erythropoietin, EPO, right? Many athletes use this to dope, like in the Tour de France. That increases a critical factor that is important for transporting blood, and that is, of course, your hemoglobin. And when your hematocrit increases, that increases your blood viscosity. So this really goes under-recognized. And if we think about cardiometabolic health, most people think about LDL cholesterol. It's the first thing a doctor's gonna say, well, let's look at your cholesterol. They might then look at your blood pressure and so forth. But we're gonna talk a lot about blood viscosity because I think in the next 10 or 20 years when there's new ready, uh, available testing to assess blood viscosity, this is going to be the next big, big thing because it turns out that the sheer stress of your blood is actually driving the process of atherosclerosis. And that is the narrowing and the occlusion of your vessels. Does that make sense? So we think about, well, LDL is oxidized. It, gets, uh, it goes into the intima layer. It gets engulfed by the macrophages. There's this inflammation. Then there's the scarring and the placking. Well, what, what's causing that? Could it be that the, the, in, the initial insult is thick, viscous, stagnant blood that is creating sheer stress in the vessels? And that is actually causing problems with memory, with cognition. It's causing microcirculatory problems. This is why type 2 diabetics generally have uh, poor uh, blood flow in the legs. So it's really important, of course, to exercise and move. But staying hydrated, most men, especially men on HRT, should be donating blood, okay? And I say most men because not all men, in fact, there's a gentleman here who just shared with me his labs, and he was anemic, okay? So this is, it's, it's, you know, it's not this dogmatic binary thing. There's a spectrum. But most women before menopause probably shouldn't be donating blood therapeutically frequently because women bloodlet in their reproductive years every single month, or at least they should be, by way of menstruation. So blood viscosity is a big one. 
We're also gonna talk about liver health. Okay, so what's unique about when you do your blood work, there's three tests, and this is what irks me when you go to the doctor. They usually only run two of them. Like, why didn't you run the GGT? This happens to be the most important liver enzyme, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, GGT. Okay, next time you go to your standard doctor, just say, please run my GGT. But many doctors, they were taught in medical, any physicians here? No, PA, right. We were taught about GGT, look for it in what clinical case? Well, like, in, like if someone comes in, they say, ah, like, how often do you drink, like stuff like Right, so mostly in people, type 2 diabetics, metabolic syndrome, and then alcoholics, because that's going to reliably increase GGT. But it turns out that many people, as they become more metabolically unhealthy, and of course, many of you in here are very metabolically healthy, and thank you for being a role model for your family, your friends, your community, your coworkers. What happens, the organ that tends to get challenged first when we start to go off our healthy way of eating and we stop exercising is in fact your liver, even before the fat cells. So your liver takes the brunt of this. And so what a lot of people look at is their glucose, and that's fine, but your glucose can be compensated by hyperinsulinemia, okay? So we do look to the liver, and so it's important to look at these liver enzymes and see what they're doing. Are they elevated or are they over 30? Are they changing in the right direction? And then we're gonna talk a lot about triglycerides. Hello. Um, so there's a cheat sheet on my website, highintensityhealth.com, right on the front page. You do have to opt into the email list. I swear we don't spam you with a bunch of junk. It's really good content. But when you opt in, you can download that, that PDF cheat sheet and it has all the lists of labs, and these are standard labs that, that you can all get at any major laboratory company throughout the, um, the America, particularly in, and throughout the world, okay? Triglycerides. The conversation around triglycerides is changing, okay? Most people, so someone here recently got their labs, what did your physician or PA tell, or nurse practitioner tell you to do 12 hours before you do your labs, you should? Fast, fast okay? Think about that. How many people actually fast for 12 hours in a day? Most people do not even fast just 12 hours, right? After dinner, they have ice cream, then they wake up and they have a muffin. So you're getting an artificial representation of, about their metabolic health that doesn't reflect their day-to-day -day functionality. So this is what I encourage people when they say, should I go on a carnivore diet? Should I go on a keto carnivore diet? Should I eat honey, whatever? It's like, I don't know. Why don't you try, have a meal, that you think is healthy for you. Maybe it's ribeye, olives, this is my favorite meal, ribeye, olives, little kimchi, and depending if I'm working out or not, maybe some sweet potatoes or butternut squash, right? And then you can go 90 minutes later and test your non-fasted labs. That's going to give you a much better insight into how your body is processing those foods. Does that make sense? Like that's why you have a cardiovascular stress test on a treadmill. These people are not sitting on their couches playing Nintendo at the cardiology's, you know, at the clinic, right? They are stressing their heart and they're running an EKG to see, hey, what is going on when Sally Smith over here who has, she's out of breath and she's hypertensive. The, the cardiologists are trying to figure out when we stress the heart, what happens? And so eating as nourishing as it can be is a mild stressor. Has anyone heard that before? Eating is a stressor. And this is kind of funny if you think about fasting. People say, don't fast, it raises cortisol. Well, it's like, then you should never eat if you're scared of cortisol because guess what happens when you eat? Cortisol goes up. No one's scared of eating, but people say, oh, don't fast, oh, it's hard on your adrenals. You're like, okay, well then maybe you should never eat again. Oh, if you're scared of cortisol, maybe you should always sleep because when you get out of bed, your cortisol goes up. So the point of this is to talk about the nuance and the gray area. I think as a culture, as a world, uh, as a collective, we become so binary, black or white. This is good, this is bad. You're vaccinated or you're unvaccinated. Oh, you're masked or unmasked. It's like, no, no, no. There's context, there's gray area, even in metabolic health, okay? So I think that's a really um, important thing to talk about. And what's interesting here is this idea of looking at labs, non-fasted, has been talked about in the medical literature 
and, and, and doctors and opinion leaders, expert panels have been encouraging clinicians to do this since 2009. But how many clinicians are actually practicing this now? So it takes so long. So some people are like, well, you're not a doctor. Why are you talking about labs? Like, well, look, expert doctors are talking about this in the literature, yet most doctors are not actually practicing this. I remember reading this. I remember exactly where I was in Denver, Colorado in 2009. I thought, oh my gosh, a lipid load test. Non-fasting way to look at triglycerides. That is brilliant. But yet every doctor says you should come in fasted. Like, that doesn't make any sense. We need to look at the system under stress, okay? And so the way to do that practically is you just consume a meal that you would normally use. Or if you're working with a client and they say, gosh, I think I'm, I don't know if keto is working for me. I can't lose the weight. It's like, okay, well, what happens when you eat the keto meal in the 90 minute post meal or post prandial period? Oftentimes what happens is the blood triglycerides go through the roof if people are not doing well on a low carb, high fat diet, okay? So just like if you eat glucose and your glucose shoots up and then insulin has to compensate and then you go hypoglycemic, when people have poor metabolic health, their, fat, their levels of triglycerides can go up so high and it can cause a lot of blood viscosity. It can cause a lot of ectopic lipid deposition. That is when lipids go into tissues where they shouldn't be, like your heart, your pancreas, your liver, and your muscle. Okay, most Americans, not you all, most Americans have fatty muscle, fatty liver, fatty hearts, and fatty pancreases. And we wonder why the hospitals have been overfilled for like three years, whatever. It's like, we need to focus on that. That is the major problem because when you have fat infiltrating into those places where they shouldn't be, it causes deranged signaling throughout the body. Inflammatory processes, oxidative stress, accelerated aging, dysregulated mitochondrial function, okay? So what's your homework? Next time you do labs, are you gonna, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna go defy the doctor's orders and like eat a little meal beforehand? Who's gonna try it? Who's gonna like be brave enough? All right, all right, that's cool. Now here's the thing. You should try, you should, if you haven't done labs for a long time, you might wanna just do a fasted lab panel. So you're, you're comparing apples to apples. Then. Six months later, 12 months later, you change your diet, you start to lose some weight, you think, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm headed in the right direction. So this time, I'm going to do a non-fasted panel, okay? Because if you haven't done labs at all, and it comes back really high, you're gonna see out of range and be like, oh my gosh. It's like the work, you're, you're gonna be oh, like, oh, something is wrong with me, my liver screwed up, and then I have, you know. so it's better to have a baseline, and then you compare that to something down the road. Does that make sense? Likewise, and I have slides on all this stuff, but when we think about LDL cholesterol, right? Dr. said, of course LDL cholesterol is driving heart disease. We need to drop it to the floor. Well, I was working with a client who was very into exercise and couldn't even take a break from exercise before doing fasted labs. Like, okay, whatever, I, just, just do the labs, okay? And her LDL cholesterol came back over 400, over 400. So most mainstream doctors would be like, we are putting you on a statin, a fibrate. We are maybe even going to stent you. Your arteries must be completely clogged. But what LDL cholesterol is doing, especially in metabolically healthy people, athletes, people like you who are metabolically flexible, is it's partitioning energy. Okay? When you look at how cholesterol is measured when you go and get it, it's really an estimation. It'll say LDL-cholesterol. And if you look below that, depending upon if you go to LabCorp or if you go to Quest or even a, a, a hospital laboratory, okay, they're going to tell you which one of the eight methods they use to estimate the cholesterol inside the LDL lipoprotein particle. This I want to spend some time on. I, I, I just, it's not semantics. This is real science that people need to know about because it transitions into ApoB and that's way better for you all to measure, okay? So imagine if someone was like, you know, I'm gonna do a study. I'm gonna do a study because we have found that these small little dense cars, you've heard of LDL cholesterol, big buoyant particles are, are more protective. The small dense particles are more atherogenic. Who's here heard about the LDL particles? Okay, many of you. So there's different phenotypes within LDL cholesterol, okay? We know that the small dense LDL particles are more readily oxidizable. They can it's like if you think of a tennis net, you throw a tennis ball at a tennis net, it bounces back. What happens if you throw a golf ball? 
it's going through. So if you think about the, your vascular endothelium as sort of a tube, and there's some semi-permeable aspects of it, and let's just say you have some blood viscosity issues, you have some sheer stress, you're eating canola oil, and so your LDL cholesterol is really oxidizable, it gets oxidized, it gets into that intima medial layer, macrophages come onto it, you start to develop plaque, okay? So that's the basic synopsis of atherosclerosis that leads to coronary artery disease and other peripheral vascular disease. But back to the analogy, so you have these small, dense cars on the road. Let's just say they're, they are a problem. So scientists are like, look, we're going to figure out, we're going to solve this problem once and forever because the small, dense cars are causing accidents, okay? So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to count how many people are in the cars. And that will tell us the size of the cars. Would that make any sense? Could you, could you reliably count the number of people in the cars? Let's just say, oh, it's a Prius, it has one person. It's a Suburban, it has one person. Oh, it's an Escalade, it has two people, right? Oh, it's, it's a Camry, it has four people. It would be all over the place, right? You could never figure out the size of the car by testing how many people were in the car. Yes or yes? That makes sense. You'd have to actually count the cars. The car size is the problem in the analogy, right? We're talking about LDL cholesterol, small dense particles versus big buoyant fluffy particles. But that is what most doctors are doing. They're counting the people in the cars. Again, so you go and get your LDL cholesterol tested. Doctor says, oh my gosh, Sam, your levels are like 130. I, you know, you're, you're borderline high risk. You know, I'd recommend you go on a statin. You know, I know it might cause diabetes. It might cause, you know, rhabdomyolysis. I mean, it might, you know, cause some erectile issues, but you should really go on a statin. She's like, fuck, all right, all right fine, I'll go on a statin, whatever, right? But you know what? They're looking at the cholesterol in the LDL particle. Just want to make sure we understand. They're testing the stuff inside. They're not looking at the particle itself. The particle is the problem in the context of atherosclerosis. It's the particle that's interacting with the vessel wall. It's the particle that's getting oxidized. It's not the stuff inside the particle. So this is why we shouldn't just be looking at LDL cholesterol or even HDL cholesterol. We're going to henceforth look at ApoB and ApoA1. It's a super expensive test, guys. It costs $10. I don't know if anyone can afford it. I don't know. You might have to get a loan for this test, but it is way more sensitive, way more specific, and it's going to give you better information about your cardiometabolic risk compared to just looking at LDL cholesterol. Because I'll tell you, I used to sell lipoprotein particle testing. And I would go to these doctors, these cardiologists, major clinics, and I thought, oh my gosh, this, this account is going to be a home run. I'm thinking about, I already spent the money in my head. Like, they, they probably would run hundreds of tests a day. And I would talk to these doctors and say, you're still, and this is, friends, this is in 2009. They were still running LDL cholesterol, and they had no, they couldn't care less, because it was going to take more time out of their, their practice to look at the actual particle themselves. This is still true today. So you're going to have to nudge and cajole your doctor and say, you know what? Yeah, I want you to run your ApoB to A1 ratio. Okay. Very simple. It's an add-on. It literally costs nothing. They have the blood. Um, it's really important. And so as that number gets closer to one, okay, so, so the thing is we can't talk about how bad LDL is without talking about all the good stuff that HDL does. HDL ant has antioxidant capacities. HDL cholesterol and, and the particle in and of itself um, is involved in reverse cholesterol transport. So we need to talk about LDL in the context of HDL and every single bad cholesterol, so to speak, or LDL cholesterol, VLDL cholesterol, remnant or intermediate density lipoprotein, has one molecule of ApoB on it. So when you go to the doctor and they say, well, you know, Sam, your cholesterol is 130. You say, what's my ApoB? Ah, oh, it's like 85. What's my ApoA1? Oh, it's 177. So your ratio is 0.5 or something to that sort. Very low risk. There's no need that that individual should be on a statin. Does that make sense? So this is something that Obama talked about a long time with, with precision medicine with the Affordable Care Act, that was gonna be the big tenet. We're gonna change medicine, make it more precise to the individual. 
we actually haven't done that. Some doctors are doing that, but as a whole, most physicians are not practicing that way. So this is how you can custom tailor labs for you because you are an individual. You probably don't want to go on a medication that has side effects that you don't have to deal with if you shouldn't be on that medication. So this is what's, oh, boom, look at that. Getting fancy over here, all right. So we can just kind of skip, skip. Mm. Um, back one. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, the liver. Okay, so is this helpful so far? Yes. Can you hear me and everything? Yes. We're good. All right. Okay, so what I was mentioning about the car analogy, this is the first time I've actually done this. Did that make sense or no? Yeah. All right, because this is like the stuff in the car is what you're measuring. This is, okay, inside your lipoproteins, your good and bad cholesterol, you have cholesterol. You also have triglycerides and you have sphingolipids, okay? So inside the car, there's stuff and that's what's actually being estimated. It's not actually even being directly measured when you get your LDL cholesterol, by the way. I mean, uh, you might be disappointed to know. It's literally an estimate. They're estimating how much stuff is in there. But what's happening is it's the exterior of the lipoprotein particle itself that's actually causing the problems, okay? So that's why we're, again, we're looking at ApoB to A1. Now, um, there were some formatting things that got on, but I think what's interesting about the cholesterol elevations and even the, the, the triglyceride elevations is they're more a, a link with ceramide signaling dysfunction, okay? And I don't want to get too much into this, but I think in the next 15 years, we're going to be able to dr directly assess the ceramides. And these are dysfunctional fatty acid-like compounds that are changing gene and me metabolic expression within the body causing fatty liver disease, causing fat storage, causing fatty pancreas, and much more. And so when you get insulin resistant and you have all the cardiometabolic problems, it's the ceramides increase along with the triglycerides and the LDL cholesterol. But that gets complex and we're not gonna go into that. So we can sort of move on and actually look at some labs here. A good paper for, for y'all um, to check out, okay? Um, if you wanna take a screenshot or a picture or whatever, or if you don't care, you're like, I trust you, ceramides are a problem, fine. Um, <laughs> But let's get to some labs because this, I think, really helps. Uh, gosh, the formatting is just a little bit. Um, what do we it have had, going? It had, to, it had to switch from keynote to Windows. Plug in his computer? It, won't, it won't go to HDMI. Um, well, so let's just look at this. This summarizes what, where we were going here. What we see here, and I, I alluded to it, but I'll just mention it now, uh, the liver. Okay, how do you assess the liver? Well, I mean, you can do an ultrasound. There's all sorts of things. You can do an MRI. But the easiest way via labs is to look at your three liver function tests. Okay, I'll just, I see a lot of you writing it down. So AST, ALT, and GGT. Now there's alkaline phosphatase. There's other related, there's albumin that's made by the liver, right? But let's just focus on those three. What you start to see first in people who become more insulin resistant is the ALT and the GGT start to increase, okay? So instead of just looking at LDL cholesterol, we need to look at the LDL cholesterol and the glucose and all the metabolic parameters in context of the liver health and the fat infiltration in the liver. And so this is a classic example of an individual who has pre-fatty liver due to some challenges that are going on here. Um, with LDL cholesterol elevations and also uh, elevated triglycerides, okay? So again, we're not just looking at the A1C or the glucose, those three liver function tests, AST, ALT, GGT, in context of triglycerides and ApoB to A1, okay? Thank you. Oh, that... We're going to get on your on a sec. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, and we can flip it that way. You can put that sucker in the other one, just so I can, um, yeah. so the cord fits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. We're so high tech over here, guys. <laughs> hmm. It's fine. We, we just do without. Um, I got it all in my head. Do you want me to put mine in? I don't know. Yeah, this is weird that it won't. Play. You know, if you put yours. I wonder why it wouldn't show. If you go to settings. Yeah. It's 
displays. If you do like a mirror thing or something. We go back out. Um, it should be on display. Yeah, no, you're right. Huh? That is super strange. It's not fixing there. I think you just go back and go do it on yours. Yeah. Yeah, it lost a little bit of the conversion. Ah, uh, that's fine. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, there were only a few slides that looked like they messed up. A yeah, bit. no, it's cool. I basically know um, most of them. Okay, so the liver is, a, you only have one liver, and actually the rise in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is becoming basically an epidemic. And there's going to be, a, it sounds crazy, there's going to be a shortage of livers in the next 10, 20 years. Because we are, go ahead. Can you quickly talk about the importance of the liver and like what it does and like how those things relate? This is a phenomenal question. Uh, thank you, that was in there, but, and we can go back to a liver, just picture a liver. Um, so your liver is your main metabolic organ. Your liver is actually running the show. You know, you hear so much about the pancreas, you hear so much about the muscle, but your liver is secreting some 4,000 different enzymes and metabolites in any given moment. Your liver is constantly controlling all sorts of parameters that you're not even thinking about, from detoxification, from increasing glutathione, from, you know, bilirubin, uh, all these different things. And the liver is where lipids are actually synthesized, mainly your lipoprotein particles. So cholesterol is too big to actually be directly absorbed. Remember for years we were told, eggs, oh my, do not eat eggs. They contain cholesterol. It's like, well, actually, the cholesterol doesn't even get absorbed that way, so who gives a crap? But the point is, your liver's making the cholesterol, the atherogenic particles. So your liver is making these small, dense uh, VLDL, and then the remnants, and into the LDL, okay? And that's why you start to see frequently when people have LDL cholesterol changes and if they are trending towards more cardiometabolic disease risk, that their liver enzymes will increase. And I, I, I'm kind of belaboring this point a little bit because many of you are already metabolically healthy. And so just because your LDL cholesterol is high, that doesn't totally reflect poor metabolic health, if that makes sense. And that's why you need to feel more comfortable saying, well, look, I know my cholesterol is high, maybe, but my liver enzymes are good and my triglycerides are low. So does that sort of make sense? Your liver is a very important metabolic organ and it's constantly cross-talking with your muscle, with your fat cells as well. And so the problem with the liver, why does the liver get so fat? You might be wondering, what, what is it about the liver? Well, your fat cells, when they get overfilled with calories, with, with processed foods and so forth, they start just releasing and spilling over free fatty acids and those get deposited in the liver. And then when that deposition occurs, on the next slide, you saw the liver enzymes start to increase. Okay, so when the liver is stressed, these enzymes start to increase because it's literally being damaged at the cellular level. Now, there's another slide we're going to get to in a little bit so we can keep moving forward where we talk about how actually these enzymes are not totally specific to the liver. Just want to throw that out there. The AST is also released from the heart as well. So what we see in people who abuse anabolic steroids actually and have preclinical cardiovascular disease and low ejection fraction is they start to have elevations all across the board in these liver enzymes. So I'm going to share with you actually a, a case study of that, of an individual who's abusing steroids and SARMs, and his liver enzymes were through the roof. And that is not just specific to the liver, although his liver is being harmed, it's also uh, the heart. But because it's the winter and there's... All sorts of bugs going around, influenza A, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, pneumonia, etc. We need to understand that cholesterol is not all that bad. You know what your cholesterol does when you get sick? It's binding pathogens that you're exposed to. So cholesterol was actually, this paper I think was in 1950, what's the reference here? Or 1988, but it, it was a long time ago. Scientists figured out, well, wait, lipoproteins, they neutralize bad stuff too. And that might be why, my friends, we see people when they drop their LDL cholesterol to the floor, they don't live as long compared to people who have higher cholesterol. And Dave Feldman has actually uncovered the raw data from the NHANES and actually figured this out, that people with very low LDL cholesterol do not live longer compared to people who actually have elevated LDL cholesterol. This might be because LDL cholesterol is actually an endotoxin sponge. Every time you eat, you release a little bacteria from your gut. You have way more bacterial cells than human cells. You release that. It's normal. It happens, right? But 
If you go to McDonald's, you have a Big Mac, you have French fries, you have a soda pop, you have all, you're releasing a lot of gut bacteria into your body. And so you actually need lipoprotein particles to neutralize that. And that might be why some of those people actually have high LDL cholesterol in the first place as a protective mechanism to neutralize the endotoxin. And there was some actual data showing in COVID-19, the same situation. People with low LDL cholesterol didn't fare as good. They had a higher probability of severe COVID because as these other studies show, actually let's, let's hang on on this one, on the labs right here. Um, Potentially. And so the question was, if you have intestinal permeability, is it normal then to have higher LDL cholesterol? And every situation is a little bit different, but possibly. And that would be a compensatory phenomenon. So if you ignored the leaky gut, kept eating the same foods, and took a pharmaceutical to lower the LDL cholesterol, in a sense, you might be exacerbating the problem, if that makes sense. Okay, so the next slide has some labs that we're going to get into and talk about. So, uh, really important to look at this. So we talked about the liver enzymes, they're very important. That's one of the first things we're gonna look at. We're also gonna focus on triglycerides. Triglycerides are an unsung hero because there's no blockbuster drug to lower triglycerides. You know what does lower triglycerides very effectively in addition to exercise and eating low carb? Fish oil. I saw this in the clinical practice back starting in 2005. Um, a doctor, I was interested in practicing medicine, did my undergrad, et cetera. I worked for Dr. Gerard Guillory, shadowed him for you know, all the time, and actually ended up working in his practice as a nutritionist. But he would put patients on omega-3 fats, just two to four grams per day. Their triglycerides would drop like a rock. Now, the problem with fish oil, if you're a pharmaceutical company, is it's really affordable. So it's not going to make a lot of money. So you don't hear a lot of people talking about fish oil. Although there is medical foods. Has anyone heard of a medical food? So this is where... where Drug companies will take a supplement and say, well, it's, yeah, it's a supplement, but we're going to call it a medical food, and you have to prescribe it. So there are medical food fish rolls that are essentially the same as high-quality supplements that you can buy, but they reliably lower triglycerides, okay? So I'm encouraging you to exercise, especially after you eat. Sleep good. Breathe through your nose while you're sleeping. Sleep apnea. Sleep disorder breathing actually raises triglycerides. Major problem. Eat a low-carb diet if you're not exercising a lot, and so forth. But we want to look at LDL bad cholesterol in addition to the ApoB that we talked about in the context of the triglycerides. What are the triglycerides doing? What is the ApoB to A1 ratio? What are the liver enzymes? And then should we be concerned about lipids and so on? Okay, we can move, move along here. Um, okay, so this was a, an individual where this was a concern, not that he should go on a statin, but that he should accelerate his lifestyle changes and exercise because he had high LDL cholesterol, liver enzymes were elevated, triglycerides were elevated, and CRP is super high, 4.1. This should be under you know, 0.8. I mean, really, most people, it's like 0 0.16, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 at most, and most healthy people, CRP. Unless you're sick, your CRP should not be over 1%. Okay. Now, some people have mold in their home. Some people have Epstein-Barr, chronic issues, and so forth. I'm not blaming them for having high CRP, but we, this, if this is elevated, then we are concerned about lipids, and we need to catalyze the lifestyle change and emphasize that as well so we can move on. Okay, so I, I sort of mentioned, I said it a few different times, but this is an important time to talk about the fact that your heart is a muscle, Okay. How many people die prematurely is because they have coronary artery disease, meaning they have a narrowing or occlusion in the vessels that fuel the heart that causes a myocardial infarction or heart attack. And people get chest pain, they get out of breath, they go to the emergency room, hopefully they make it in time. They can get put on anti-inflammatories, nitroglycerin, et cetera, and hopefully survive. But this is how most people actually die prematurely here in the US, okay? But what did I just say? Your heart's a muscle. Your heart is a muscle. So if you have sick muscle, if you have a sick liver, if you have overfilled fat cells, how can we expect that the muscle of the heart and the vessels that fuel that muscle to be healthy? Why would we think that if we just give someone a statin that that would circumvent that? It doesn't. 
And so what we need to focus again on is the blood viscosity and then looking at the apoB to A1 ratio, the liver enzymes, and so forth. But here's a schematic of sort of what's going on. And, and how does that heart muscle lose, become ischemic or lose its ability to oxygenate itself? It's because the arteries get narrower and narrower. And part of that process could be from consuming highly oxidizable oils in the diet that prone LDL cholesterol to become oxidized and prone the remnant lipoproteins, or VLDL cholesterol, to become oxidized. And they get inside this layer, and they cause inflammation. And that inflammation over time becomes calcified and, and narrows, and then pretty soon you have heart failure, preclinical cardiovascular or coronary artery disease. And so basically what mainstream medicine will do is come in through your femoral artery and put a stent in there to open that up transiently. But if someone doesn't fix their lifestyle, you know the outcomes are actually not much different. If you stent someone who has coronary artery disease and they don't change their diet and lifestyle, they continue to develop the atherosclerosis just in other places. Okay? So this is why nutrition is very important. And I'm not the biggest anti-seed oil person, but what I do think is if people have high LDL cholesterol and VLDL, they should definitely avoid all of those omega-6 highly oxidizable seed oils, the canola, the cotton seed, the sunflower, they're in everything. And unfortunately, they're in a lot of low-carb products too. Low-carb cookies, you're like, oh my gosh, there's one gram of carbs in these cookies. And then you look, you're like, well, it's like modified uh, sunflower oil, okay? So I think that can be problematic because it's been shown that the higher concentrations of these omega-6 fats in the diet prone your lipoproteins to become oxidized. So I think that's the biggest problem. Now, there's probably other issues that people know much more about, how they're made, benzene, toluene, all the caustic agents involved in, in manufacturing these oils and getting them out of the seeds and so forth. But I think there's some misconception here that, well, because omega-3 fats are also unsaturated, they too get oxidized and they should always be avoided. And that data is actually not true, okay? So the omega-3 fats actually increase antioxidant enzymes. And so they can be helpful, particularly for people with high LDL cholesterol and high triglycerides. So again, there's nuance here. It's not binary. But just make sure that when you buy your omega-3 fats, they're third-party tested, IFOS certified. There's this international fish oil standards group that will actually independently audit every batch and so forth, make sure that they're low on oxidation products. Okay. We can continue on here, and we're gonna, um, we already talked about that. Here's the ApoB stuff. You know, if you opt in for, or I'll give this to Brian, give the slides, and he can email these to you guys, because I'm sorry that, that uh, you know, you're not able to actually see these. But these are just details about ApoB, just for your background and context. But you can trust me that scientific literature unequivocally confirms that ApoB, in the context of ApoA1, is way more sensitive and specific than LDL cholesterol. Okay, so that's what's here. All right, um, we've talked about a lot, so I'd like to kind of spread this out. We have a little give giveaway. So um, there's, we, full disclosure, so I have a supplement company and we sell some things. We also sell testing, but I do want to give away an omega-3 index test to a person who can guess what the average American's omega-3 index is out of a percentage, and I'll just hint, you know, it's under 15, okay? That, but just, take, just randomly guess the number, but I'll just tell you that the, the scientific studies show that people who have a low omega-3 index, lower than 5, it's actually 5.3 or something to that effect, are significantly more likely to suffer from sudden cardiac death compared to people who have a omega-3 index over 6%. So with that in context, and this has been validated for the past 20 years, it's a $49 test, it's really cool. I recommend doing it just like once every like three or four years just to see, you know, are you really getting enough salmon or fish in your diet, especially when they're seasonally available uh, in, the, in the summer months. So where do you think the average American's omega-3 index is? Anyone want to take a stab? Three. Haven't heard it yet. You're close. It's, like, it's, it's north of three, south of five. <laughs> yeah. It's like 4.5. Uh -oh. Who said 4? Uh -oh. Did he say 4? Okay. Cool, man. So basically what you do, it's like a glucose test. You just prick your finger. 
and look at it. And the reason why I like that test too is it will also look at your omega-6 levels in your red blood cells as well, okay? So for people who are like, I don't have canola oil, I'm totally fine, but they're having the processed foods, they might not recognize that, gosh, their omega-6 levels in their diet is, is really high. So the, I think the omega-3 supplementation is more important for people who have been consuming high omega-6s for a long time because that stuff gets incorporated into your cell membranes. All right, we can, yeah. I mean, you, yeah, exercise, eat healthy. Um, I mean, the good thing is your body's renewing every day. And your, a portion of your red blood cells are renewing every single day. Now, the entire life cycle is going to be on average, I think it's 90 days, or everyone's a little bit different. So I would just make sure that, sounds weird, but you're going to the bathroom every day. Taking a poo is a great way to detox. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't go number two on a regular basis. So that's important. Um, but yeah, just being consistent and follow the 80-20 principle when it comes to the food choices and eating clean and, and so forth. With which one? Uh, with omega oh, teen, yes, yeah. great question. Um, well, my daughter is here and as much as I love her, it's hard to always have her eat the same exact foods that I eat. And so yeah, we do nutritionally supplement with different things because kids can be picky eaters, you know, and especially for teenagers, it might be going to friends' houses where you can't control the food environment, which is all too common. So I think it is good because there's some interesting data actually from Australia. They looked at inmates and found that inmates with a low omega-3 index, and they just looked at them in, when they came into prison, looked at their omega-3 index, and then evaluated why they came into prison. There was a bias towards violent crimes in individuals and violent sentences, murder, homicide, gun violence, and so forth, compared to people who had higher omega-3 indexes. Now, that's not to say that, oh, if you eat fish, you won't do violent stuff, <laughs> but, but your, bra your brain it depends upon signaling and impulsivity and turning on the prefrontal cortex to say, you know what, maybe I shouldn't shoot this person over a necklace, <laughs> you know? Like that, those, those, having those neurologic signaling pathways are better, and so, the omega-3 index, or increasing omega-3s for people who might be impulsive, who might be reactionary or have a history of that, that might actually be valid because of, it's really a cell-to-cell -cell communication. And I think that's the big picture when we change our diet. We're eating the things that become us eventually, right? The food that you ate tonight, that's going to become you, okay? So if you deviate and you have ice cream, it's, it's only one day a week or one every two weeks. So, when we eat these foods, we need to remember they, they become our components. Um, so we can go on. Great questions, by the way. Okay, um, this was just to say that there's actually a correlation between low vitamin D and high ApoB. And I think this might have to do with the fact that vitamin D is a hormone. Many of you know this. You're like, oh, of course, Mike, I know it's a hormone. Come on. So vitamin D is a hormone, but it improves insulin sensitivity, okay? Now, I think vitamin D gets a bad rap because people say, oh, it's a vitamin. Ugh, whatever, I don't like vitamins, like they say. Well, it, it impacts many different steroidal pathways in the body and insulin sensitivity. And so there's a correlation between atherogenic dyslipidemia, high ApoB, LDL cholesterol, and, and triglyceride elevations, and vitamin D insufficiency. So I put a paper there just so you can recognize that because this time of year, are we north or south of Atlanta, Georgia? I need to look on the map. Would anyone? Uh, we're a little bit south, about just barely. Miles, miles. Okay, so we're just so anywhere north of Atlanta, Georgia, you're not getting cutaneous synthesis of vitamin D this time of year, between October and March. Okay, so we're kind of right in that that cut point. Now, I know a lot of people love to go outside, and I encourage that as well. Just the photoreceptors in your skin and the circadian rhythm and your retina and, and all of that, but you may not be getting the cutaneous synthesis of vitamin D even if you're outside during the months of October through March. Now it's way worse where I live in Washington, way worse. Um, you're getting much more here. But many of the studies um, have been conducted by Michael Hollick over at Boston University. He would have these college students lay out like in December on the rooftops and stuff and zero cutaneous synthesis of vitamin D, okay? So that's important. So, if you're going to supplement something during the winter, vitamin D with K2 is a good choice, just to let you know, because it is involved in so many different aspects. 
I think so. Yeah. Um, you don't have to, you know, but, and also take it with fat. Vitamin D is fat soluble. Um, I think a lot of people are not getting enough K2 in their diet anyway. They're not eating fermented foods and these things. And of course, your gut bacteria can make K2 as well uh, and vitamin K. But, it's, but it is important, I think, periodically to supplement because vitamin K is very involved in coagulation and, and blood homeostasis and bone health. Really important because I can't tell you how many female clients I've worked with that have had major arthritic procedures, orthopedic procedures because of osteopenia osteoporosis. This is another big phenomenon, which is interconnected. Bone loss is actually a metabolic disease. Osteosarcopenic obesity. So you have the osteo means bone, sarcopenic muscle loss, obesity. So the more fat you gain, it changes all the, the different cellular signaling molecules that ex accelerate bone loss and muscle loss at the same time. So again, we go to the specialist, oh, I got a bone specialist and I got a cardiologist and I got to go to the hepatologist for my liver. It's all the same. So this is why lifestyle medicine, coming to these events, working out like outside that you saw people doing before, taking sauna, very important because we're treating the whole body. How many IEs of vitamin D? Yeah, you know, everyone's a little bit different based upon their ethnicity, their age. I've seen some people um, just take 4,000 IUs a day and their, their levels get close to like 55, 60. And so the ranges that I'm familiar with here is more the lab core. It's the nanograms per ml range. Um, you can overdo vitamin D. And so we'll talk about that. But you want the sweet spot is right around 65 nanograms per ml. OK. Do you have a resource somewhere with like these optimal like, ranges and like, levels that we should be at with vitamin D, all the other things that you talked about? That on the cheat sheet, it has that. Um, but what we can do at the end is I'll list, I have summary slides with all of the ranges so that you can take pictures on your phone. Would that help? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, vitamin D just think 65. Medicare eligibility year, right? <laughs> so <laughs> easy way to remember that. Isn't it 65 or is it 60? 65, okay, good, just making sure. So um, yeah, and then you might get diminishing returns after 65 because what happens is your calcium can start to increase, your serum calcium. This is not too common, but it does happen. A lot of people, especially during COVID, were crushing vitamin D. I remember reading comments, I'm taking 100,000 a day. I'm like, all right, you can do that short term, by the way, totally fine. So for example, you might, I'm a little nasally and whatever. I'm like, oh my gosh, I felt something coming on. So I was crushing vitamin D two days, 100K. But that's it, right? Just to like give a big bolus dose and, and let it go. You don't want to continue that forever because vitamin D is fat soluble. And then you can get into toxicity issues. Okay. When you said to take it with, with fat, you think you just eat it with a meal that has fat in it? I think so. Now, if you forget, it doesn't mean you don't take it. You take it anyway. It's just the, you may go from 100% absorption to 77. I don't know, something like that. You're going to, it's not going to be ideal. But yeah, all the fat solubles, coenzyme Q10. Vitamin A, vitamin E, you want to take them with food, okay? If you're really low on vitamin D, like in the 30s, do you front load it? Like maybe the 100, like 50, and then do first more like a maintenance dose and find what works for you? That's a great idea. I would do that. I would, because vitamin D makes us feel better. It actually is involved in sleep regulation and circadian rhythm health as well. And so some people have found their sleep improved with vitamin D. So I think there's no problem with that. And again, if maybe you do 50K or 20K or something like that for 14 days or whatnot, and then you back down to maybe eight or 10. Um, so that would be what I would look at too. Now, vitamin D is not without controversy. There's a lot of people who say, well, you gotta look at the 25 OH, the 125 diet, it gets complex. Um, but I'm just gonna leave it for now. Look at the 25 uh, hydroxy vitamin D and keep it around 65. But yeah, front loading it, not a problem at all. And if you do have sleep issues, you're going through menopause, perimenopause, sleep isn't what it used to be for you, try taking your vitamin D in the evening time before bed. Some people have found that to be very effective for sleep. All right, continuing on. Oh, yeah, yeah. That is such a great question. I haven't actually thought of that before. So but. There's a lot of junk. It's so much junk. 
Oh my gosh. My thought is if I'm getting nothing, I'm getting this kind of like my hope. But yeah. Well, I mean, here's the thing. You can get a liquid in MCT oil, and if they're breastfeeding still, you can put on your nipple, and they can get it that way. You know? I think that's a, and just, I've been in the supplement industry for a long time. You save a lot of money if you buy liquids or powders, okay? Just if, it, with given the option, capsule magnesium versus powdered, you're going to go powdered because you save money. Same with vitamin D. So a, a bottle of vitamin D, there's like a year's supply is like $20, okay? And you can get a clean one as well. Um, so yeah, we can kind of rip through some of this stuff. And then we're going to get to... Um, all right, let's just kind of leave it here for a little bit because I did go through this fast. This was, we were talking about uh, how triglycerides have been ignored for a long time, but they are a major problem. I mentioned that. There's tons of slides that I can get to about all the different scientific studies. Um, hopefully by now you trust me a little bit about the research, so we don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but we want to focus on your triglycerides and then re remember, what was after you do your set of fasted labs, maybe six, eight months later, what do you do? Non-fasted, right? Just to see. And you might test it. You can Google lipid load test and see what comes up for you if you would like. Just wait 90 minutes and then, you know, have your meal. If it's 87 minutes and you're at the lab, it's fine. It's in the postprandial window. You want to just make sure that your postprandial triglycerides are under 200, okay? Which, by the way, this is why I stopped drinking Bulletproof coffee. I like Dave Asprey, I like Bulletproof Coffee, I was like addicted to this, like, oh my gosh, so one, two, more is better. And then I went, I was looking, you know, like, hey, I want to know what, what is this doing to my triglycerides, which are normally around 47 to 50. They went up over to uh, 220, way higher than I was comfortable with uh, on, having on a regular basis. As a treat, fine. Well, Bulletproof Coffee, I'll go out with a friend and have one. But every day, just slamming, because we're going to get into blood viscosity in a minute, Hypertriglyceridemia is a major factor involved in thickness of blood. Think motor oil. It's very dense, dense, very thick. Got a lot of fat floating in the blood. It's going to be thick. It's going to be viscous. It's going to create more shear stress on your vessels. So I'm not saying never do a bulletproof coffee. I have some clients who have Parkinson's, and they have to have one because it dramatically improves their symptoms. So you got to look at this in, in context. Um, but it's, when you start doing these non-facet labs, it's quite interesting. Okay, we can keep going here. Keep going till we see some um, labs here. Okay, um, actually, here's a picture. Uh, lady here just asked about. So we're gonna talk about metabolic health and go through some labs and have some fun. So we're about an hour in. How's everyone doing? Great, great. Good, having fun, learning or unlearning, one of the two. <laughs> Okay, so if you got a picture of this, this is where we're going to go. And again, this is just sort of how I look at this when a client comes to me, first time, initial visit. First, I want to look at symptoms, right? Just because you have an abnormal lab, that doesn't mean that anything is necessarily wrong. It could be the day of the test. It could be the lab error. Um, it could be that they were sick. Uh, it can just be a genetic fluctuation. So. Uh, but we're going to focus on this, and I'm going to go through, we'll just rip through some of these. Okay, so this is an individual here. You know, this is a good situation. Um, oh, yes, okay. This was my very first client. He happened to be a doctor, okay? Way back in 2007. This is like the most common, you might want to take, this is for men who have an enlarged abdomen, who have sleep disorder breathing, who eat fast food, who stay up and are stressed. This is like... Anyone could, you could catch this all day long. That's what you see. So what do we look at? We're like, well, yeah. I mean, if you just looked at his glucose and his hemoglobin A1C, you're like, well, it's not ideal. Fasting glucose, 95, hemoglobin A1C, 5.4. Most doctors would be like, you know what? You're trending in the wrong direction. Come back in 90 days. We'll retest after you start exercising, right? That's sort of what most people would say. But when we start to dig deep into this, and we see, wow, it's triglycerides, 154. Then we look at his liver enzymes. So his liver is starting to fill up with fat. These liver enzymes ideally, ideally are gonna be around 25, 28, okay? They're all units per, or international units per liter. Now, there, sometimes it can be 10, 11, 15, like the lower side of things, not totally concerning in most cases, but when they start creeping up over 30, 
it doesn't, it's smoke. It doesn't mean there's a major fire, but you're seeing smoke over 30, okay? But when you see liver enzymes over 30, one's at 52, and triglycerides are at 154, and we go to the next page, um, what do we see? Low vitamin D, of course. This very common, and people are not supplementing. We see this correlation, right? Was it the vitamin D that caused all this? Was it his diet? Was it his exercise? And if we continue on to the next one, I think, um, was this a, a retest? Uh, I'm, no, what we're looking at here is, man, Sorry, I'm, the order, I'm out of order, so I'm a little, can we go to the next one? Shoot, um, I think we skipped a slide in there. But I, what I wanted to share with you is his blood viscosity markers. Just write this down. His hemoglobin and hematocrit. Eight CT for hematocrit. This is a percentage. Usually for most men, it's gonna be somewhere in the 40s, unless they're anemic, okay? His was 51%. He's not an endurance athlete. Okay, so this is the thing you need to understand. In the Tour de France, Lance Armstrong, Team Postal, they were blood doping to get their hematocrit as close to 50 but not over it as possible. Because when you're an endurance athlete, a high hematocrit is going to help you win races. That's why they were transfusing their own blood undercover and they got major trouble for that. But if you're not an endurance athlete, you do not need a hematocrit close to 50%. More in the low 40s for men and women, okay? But unfortunately, in a lot of women, I have some cases here, it's, it's in the 30s, and they're anemic, and they feel tired. They have exercise intolerance, okay? But that's the H HCT, hematocrit, hemoglobin, HGB, okay? This individual is over 18, not good. So this means his blood is very thick, very viscous, high triglycerides, high hemoglobin, hematocrit, very thick blood, very high cardiometabolic risk, okay? And so another thing that we recommended for him was simply donating blood. And again, just like with the vitamin D cadence, right? If you're really deficient, you can increase for a short period of time. So the blood donation for him was every three months for a year, then back down to once a year and see where things are at. Because you can overdo blood, you can overdo bloodletting, okay? You can overdo blood donation. Um, I heard a question. No? Okay, good. So um, really important for men, again, we're looking at hemoglobin, I'm sorry, we're looking at glucose, hemoglobin A1C, then we're looking at triglycerides, then the liver enzymes, and then we start to also look at the hemoglobin, hematocrit, and then look at the ferritin and the iron. So we can continue on, there's, there's other ones here. Um, can we go back to this one? We'll skip that, skip that one. Um, we just talked about, those are, where to look, what's good, what's bad, so we can continue forward here. Okay, let me just quickly look at um, this one here. Oh yeah, I think, I think, if we go to the next slide, I wanna see some. All right, this one's really good. All right, so let's go back. Okay, so this is an individual, again, a classic presentation for someone who's abusing testosterone, which unfortunately is pretty common nowadays because it's so easy to get on the internet. You can buy testosterone, any steroid or SARM you want. And this individual I was actually really concerned about his health because he's a client, but also a friend of mine. And so one thing we haven't really talked about here is the serum creatinine. Okay, so this is associated with kidney function and kidney health, but it's also a reflection of your lean muscle mass. And what I see in a lot of under-muscled people, the creatinine is like 0 0.6, 0 0.55, okay? Ideally, honestly, you wanna get that closer to one. Now, it doesn't mean that you take a bunch of creatine, you know, I just gotta jack up my creatinine levels. No, it means you need to lift weights. But the creatinine is a reflection of your overall muscle mass, okay? And as, as a part of that, you're releasing more creatine breakdown because you're using your muscle, you have more muscle. Creatine is stored in your muscle. I know most of you aren't scared of creatine, but is anyone like, mm, I've heard about creatine, man, it's bad for you. Anyone, do we need to do a quick creatine crash course? Most people are sold on it because you just ate some creatine, by the way. So, just letting you know, if you're scared, <laughs> no. So creatine is naturally found in meat, but it can be an ergogenic aid. It's one of the, the legal, the best legal ergogenic aids, meaning it helps exercise performance when you use it. So I recommend, uh, I'm, and I'm biased of course, because I sell an electrolyte with creatine, but pairing those have been studied by scientists to actually improve healthy hydration, as well as actually one rep exercise performance. Anecdotally, a lot of people do enjoy that. So uh, really important for both hydration uh, and muscle health. So if we go to the next slide, really 
problematic here, you know, when you see these liver enzymes, right, when you see these in your clinic, you're like, this is no good, right? We have a physician's assistant here who's in the trenches. You start to see these things get over 100. It's not just a little smoke. You have a wildfire going on in the liver, okay? And it's not just in the liver because we also see the, actually, we don't even have the GGT, right? One second. But you see the ALT, or sorry, AST is a little bit more specific to the heart. Something is going on in the heart from, from abusing these compounds. And I've worked with a lot of men who have just like, you know what, I want to get a little bit more jack, so I'm going to take some SARMs. Because they're not, they're not steroids, they're just SARMs. Same stuff happens with their blood work. It's, it's not good. So if you know someone, I mean, and they're committed to this, low-dose HRT is going to be way safer than any of that stuff. I'll just tell you. But yeah, question in the back. Yeah, so he didn't tell me the exact dosages of the testosterone, but I'm going to guess between 500 milligrams a week and 1,000 milligrams a week. Um, so definitely abusing. HRT doses are going to be up to 150, 200 milligrams per week. Now, some people are like, oh, I'm on HRT and they're doing 300 a week. That's a full-on steroid cycle, but still, that's when you start to see, by the way, this stuff happens. It's reliable. Like, literally, if you give someone testosterone and you're a betting person, you would say, I bet their hematocrit, hemoglobin, liver enzymes are going to increase. It reliably happens. And I'm not anti-testosterone. I'm not on testosterone, but if people want to do that, I'm fine with that, so long as they do track their hemoglobin, hematocrit, to make sure their blood doesn't get thick and hypercoagulable. This is, I think, why we saw so many bodybuilders die during the pandemic, during COVID, because COVID, SARS-CoV-2 happens to increase clotting cascades in the body, okay? Now there's another thing that also increases clotting cascades in the body, but the virus itself actually increases clotting cascades. And so if your blood is already thick and viscous and you get COVID, you're, at, you're increasing the odds that that may happen, okay? So important stuff here. So in this person, I said, look, you gotta back off on whatever you're doing. And I would go and donate blood like today, if you can, like seriously, because the thickness of the blood, yes, sir. Yeah. The theory back then was that it was just creating more water. Is that still a thing today or is it has, has it changed? Yeah, it has changed. There's been a lot of randomized clinical trials in actual humans showing its effectiveness. But when creatine was first, it was a creatine monohydrate product in the late 90s, mid to late 90s. This was when bodybuilding.com was taken off, right? When, remember AOL Instant Messenger? You got mail. You're like, yes. Right? So that was during that time. <laughs> I used to order this stuff on the internet, but it also had a ton of dextrose and maltodextrin in it. That was part of the problem. And so it was literally four parts dextrose to one part creatine. So let's say you were doing 10 grams loading, you're getting 40 grams of simple sugar. So if you're already drinking Gatorade or whatever the hell else was popular at the time and that, like that's not a good recipe. So I think that's why there was side effects from that. And it wasn't directly related to the actual creatine, it was more the delivery system. Yeah, you felt puffy in that. Yeah, so now it, there is no need to load it and no need to pair it with a bunch of carbohydrates. So it's sort of, you know, the, the science has evolved and, and all that sort of stuff. And it actually really does benefit women because women don't store as much creatine as men. And, but you do use it. Uh, and it's helpful for the brain. We talked about in the back omega-3s and, and aggression. There's really good research showing creatine actually helps uh, improve cognitive function. Got a question back here. Yeah. Yeah, great question. So if you're just regularly lifting, I think up to like two grams a day, you don't have to really overdo it. If you're a seasoned lifter and you're hitting PRs and stuff, maybe you can go for five grams. But I think that's where you start to see gastrointestinal issues and stuff as you increase the dosages. Most people in the studies have looked at, you know, one to two grams a day and found benefit. Now, remember, you're still getting it from food. So if you have like a, I don't know, 14 ounce ribeye, you, you're getting north of five grams of creatine. And that's, that's you. So but I think the biggest way that, that most women should be getting creatine in their diet is from red meat. I still work with so many women who are like, I have fish, I have tilapia, but I, I don't do red meat. 
And I think maybe not in Austin or Texas as a whole, but in Washington, this is like real. This is real stuff, man. Uh, and if, you're, if you've been vegan for any length of time, you definitely need to supplement with creatine and B12 um, because you're literally getting zero from your diet. Okay, we can continue on. Okay, um, yeah, this is another one. So this is a, a woman, she's 66 years old, walks, you know, yeah, I'll lift weights, you know, every bit. next time, I'm working on it next time, next time. And so again, we see low, low creatinine here. And we also are starting to see indicators that metabolic disease is not going the right direction, so we can skip the next slide. And so we can look. Now remember, her glucose was just, I think, in the 90s, wasn't too bad. So most people would say, you're doing fine. Continue what you're doing. Maybe lose a little bit of weight and so forth. But what do we see here? We see triglycerides increase. We are starting to see uh, other changes. Um, yeah, here we go, with insulin. So insulin's on your blood work cheat sheet. We haven't talked about it up to now. Insulin here, fasting. 12.2. There's zero physiologic need for insulin to be elevated when you are fasting. Translation, insulin shouldn't be high when you're fasting. It is a postprandial hormone. Insulin helps put, insulin's anabolic. It's like, okay, food's coming in, we're gonna put that food into the cells. So if there's no stuff in the system, it should not be high. If it's high when someone is fasted, they have been eating too much stuff for a long period of time. And the best way to bring this down is exercise in the post meal window. And by exercise, I literally mean taking a walk, okay? Resistant training and compressing the feeding window, okay? And if you do feeding window compression or time restricted feeding with a low carb diet, that might actually accelerate things as well. But um, very easy to improve or reverse insulin resistance, even if there is some pancreatic beta cell uh, loss and so on. But what tells the story here? Right? Before we even looked at insulin, we would know something is going on. There's metabolic smoke. Where is it coming from? Well, we see the uh, our triglycerides are increased. We also see an elevated LDL cholesterol right here at 109, not too crazy. But in this case, yeah, we are worried. We are providing a little momentum, urging this client to, hey, you got to start to do what we're saying therapeutically, lifestyle-wise, because you are not trending in the right direction. But... This is an individual who was at Kaiser for a long time and had the mindset that, well, I went to the doctor and this is what they ran. I'm like, no, no, no. You need to pay out of pocket and run this stuff because they would never run fasting insulin. They would never run ApoB, okay? And again, if a doctor says that, just pay out of pocket. All right, next slide. Okay, very common phenomenon here um, that we see, unfortunately, women after menopause uh, inability to lose weight, getting a little frumpy, a little muffin top uh, around the abdomen and so forth. But what we see here is common trends in their labs. We see triglycerides are elevating. We see insulin, non-fasted, is increasing. And we start to see these liver enzymes increasing. So as we go down the list here, again, if you just looked at the glucose and hemoglobin A1C, glucose of 106, A1C of 5.6, not too alarming. Most doctors would be like, mm, eh. Don't have bread anymore, right? That, they might say that. But when you continue on here and look at the, um, uh, let's see, so there's the liver enzymes, and I think we go down here to, yeah, to the um, triglycerides, what? Are they 311? Yeah. Or, oh, yes, that's total. Oh, that's total cholesterol. And then we look on the next slide, I think we have the uh, insulin. Yeah. Oh, that, one was long, that one was actually worse than it looked. I, it got cut off. I was making some of these on the plane. So this one got cut off, but it was not looking good. So common trends here. Again, triglycerides are increasing, liver enzymes increase, fasting insulin is elevated. And this is what we see here with the 62-year-old woman, phenomenal woman, eating, we can go to the next one, eating excellent diet, but just could not lose the weight. And so what we see here, fasting insulin, again, over 13, very similar trend okay i have just a quick question yeah yeah when you switch from fasted to non-fasted labs i understand how it's going to affect the triglycerides or the glucose or whatever but what about your liver enzymes and your hematocrit and stuff like that does it also affect that and if so what would you expect to see in that yes this is a great question and just for the podcast and stuff so if you're doing fasted versus non-fasted which biomarkers in short are impacted it usually is the glucose insulin triglyceride ldl cholesterol hdl it's usually those. The other ones are not directly impacted as much by fasted or non-fasted states. 
So now your vitamin B12 might be, if you had a lot of meat, for example. I don't even recommend looking at serum B12. There's other ways to ascertain uh, B vitamin status that are actually a little, we'll talk about it later. But um, so yeah, those shouldn't be uh, abnormal, okay? It's a phenomenal question though. Um, okay, so again, you know, just the standard, very simple, uh, a fasting insulin costs $19. This is not cost prohibitive stuff. Has anyone had their insulin tested before? Awesome, so it's like a handful, maybe about 5%. I have a yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. In one of the clients, they were definitely on hormone replacement therapy. Uh, this one wasn't. The 66-year-old woman is and was. And I think, actually, if we go back just, I think, two slides, we look at her DHEA levels. Um, so I have other slides on this. So, yeah, she, she is on HRT. But it's a great question. After menopause, women's hormones completely change. The ovaries essentially go offline. And so where are women getting hormones from? Well, from the adrenal glands mainly. And the, adrenal is make, the adrenals are making the precursor to the testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, which women need as well. Testosterone helps women build muscle, maintain muscle, preserve insulin sensitivity, helps with intercourse. Also, the ovaries are the, uh, I'm sorry, the adrenals are a good, the adrenal-derived DHEA is also converted to estrogen, important for women as well. So as you can see, you, you always know if someone's worked with me if their DHEA is high, right? Because I'm always pushing, because there's so much good research on DHEA, it's super affordable, um, it's easy to test, and it doesn't have a lot of downsides, okay? Now, I'm not gonna recommend a D high DHEA for someone who has PCOS, or a, a woman of reproductive age, but men who are feeling lethargic, low T, getting a belly, not building muscle, I always optimize DHEA before even considering testosterone. Okay. Is that DHEA on your typical blood panel or is that something that you're adding on as well? That's what I add on. I mean, if you tell a doctor, they might look at it, but it's not standard. It should be because it's le the, the levels of DHEA start to go down around age 25. By the time you're 70, your DHEA levels, if you're an American, is about 10% of what it used to be. Okay. DHEA is a directly, it's a neurosteroid. It, it impacts cognition and brain health directly in addition to being a hormonal precursor, as I alluded to. So there's a lot of health benefits here. It, it supports immune health. It's actually involved in metabolism as well, like blood glucose control. People with low DHA sulfate generally have higher levels of insulin resistance compared to people who have optimal levels. So I'm a huge fan of it. That's the one thing that I take. People are like, oh, you want testosterone? No, I take DHA. I take 40 milligrams every single night, 40 years old, get to your question one second. Dosing for men, about 10 milligrams per decade of life. Simple math, you're 50, take 50 milligrams. 80, take 80 milligrams. You're 10, you don't need any, right? Uh, because it starts to <laughs> decline with age, uh, around 25. And for women, it's 75% of that. So, if women in their 40s, they can start at about 10 milligrams, okay? So it's a lot lower. Um, if, if women start cranking DHA, they will notice male pattern baldness. They might start to gain a little, a little mustache and have undesirable symptoms. It's really a, sad. I was working with this fitness competitor, and she, compl she came to me. She's like, I'm losing my hair, and she's a good-looking woman. I'm losing my hair. I've worked with all these doctors. No one can figure out why. I'm like, that is so crazy. Like, what would you do? She's like, I, I think it must be crash dieting or this. And she sent me her labs. I'm like, just look at your labs, you know, before we – I just want to get a, a – look at your labs before we talk, right? Literally, I read the email, I'm like, no wonder you're losing your hair. Her DHA was like over 400, okay? And she was 32, okay? So it was way off the charts high. Now, you might be saying, well, Mike, your client here is 66. Yes, this is being converted to estrogen. This is in a post-menopausal woman, not a woman of reproductive uh, age, okay? Really important. So women of reproductive age should not be cranking DHEA, especially if they're worried about hair loss and you know, getting male pattern issues and so forth. Question in the back. What can you do about 40 DHEA if it was being used for testosterone but it would create overstimulation? Overstimulation of? Like the nervous system, like they were wired. Was it a man or a woman? Yeah. Um, I would look for insulin resistance. What, do you know the age of the woman? 
40, okay. Perimenopause or not? You got, you got agitated. You got, okay. Did you test your levels before or did you, and were they low? Interesting. Right. Right. And that makes sense. That's smart thinking. Well, what I would suggest, and, and you did a cream, it wasn't oral. So here's the thing about creams. I know there's like, well, it's dermal delivery, you get more in. It's hard to titrate and know. There's not a lot of good evidence. Like, what is one tablespoon translate into this? I would always go with oral. Uh, and that's why I'm not a big fan of like testosterone or pellets or anything. Because if you start to feel like crap, that stuff is in you, right? Um, so I would go oral and I would just look at starting like five milligrams orally at night. It could be, it could be sublingual or just an oral tablet. I mean, if there's a bunch of them out there, again, you know, my biases, I have a supplement business. We sell a really good third party tested DHA that's micronized over at Myoscience, but there's a lot of other brands out there that you can look at. Um, but again, I would start lower on the dose and see if you take it at night, if that impacts things, maybe do it on a weekend because DHEA actually antagonizes cortisol a little bit. And as we get older, our, so remember DHEA is made by the adrenals. Cortisol increases with age, DHEA goes down. And so one way that we can offset the age associated catabolism is by supporting DHEA levels. So there's more balance between cortisol and DHEA. Great question. Did you have one? Yeah, and there was some research actually shown it's, it's helpful because the ratio between the cortisol when you go to bed and the cortisol when you wake up determines your sleep duration and sleep quality. The more of the delta, the better. That's why it's not good to eat late. Remember we talked about how eating raises cortisol, right? So people are like, oh, I ate late, I feel like crap. Like it could just be the mechanics of eating late is like, oh, food sitting in your stomach, but it could be the postprandial metabolic response. Cortisol is going up. And so that's why it's not good to snack before bedtime and have a bunch of ice cream and stuff like that because you can raise your cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone. I'm not saying it's bad, but it's not good when you're trying to go to bed, okay? And so the DHA might antagonize the cortisol. Now, I will say that that study is relegated to animals. We don't really have human studies on this yet, but it is more in line with how DHA would naturally be released from your adrenals via the circadian clock system anyway. So. Is this too much crap or this is good? Yes. Good, okay. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not sure. What I would do, and this is how I figure stuff out all the time, go to google.com for slash scholar. Google scholar is way easier to use than PubMed. And you can maybe find some studies on that and, and just kind of see. But I know in animals, there's been studies showing that when DHA is administered during their dark cycle, it suppresses cortisol better at night, which is good. Go ahead. Um, I'm just confused. I don't know why, um, why are people supplementing for this? Like, if, can, if you have like a good diet and everything, is it natural to have the right amount? This is a wonderful question. So do you even need to supplement with DHA? If you're feeling good, your metabolic health is good, you're recovering from exercise, there's no depression, sleep is good, then I wouldn't. And under yeah, and under four, and you're like, look, I'm preserving muscle, my friends are asking me what I'm doing, then I'd say then you probably don't. But I was wondering like why, like why are you taking it? Is that just natural, like for humans like a long time ago to have lower levels? It's a good question. It's a good question. So all hormones naturally decline with age, but the rates at the, of decline in the Western world has been accelerated. So men's testosterone levels, you've heard, they dropped some 37% in just the last 15 years. Same with DHA and all the other hormones. So that's the thing is, for me, I started to notice that I didn't have the recovery, the energy. I had this afternoon fatigue and it was just bothering me. And so that's why I did so much, re and that was like when I was 36. I'm like, gosh, why do I feel like I need coffee at three o'clock to even go to the gym? And so once I started to supplement with DHEA and of course work on other things, I noticed that that really helped me. So that's why I personally, um, that's what I found. But again, if you don't have the symptoms, then don't treat the disease just because the lab is a little off, okay?